السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين uh, Good morning to everybody الحمد لله um, Had a few minutes before you know um, I go do something else with my kids uh, So I wanted to take an opportunity to kind of Uh, touch on something that uh, I will be talking about extensively this weekend in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I will be speaking uh, about uh, in two weeks at our um, one-day marriage retreat in um, Batista, uh, Maryland, myself and that clay couple. If you have not gotten your tickets, if you have not bought your tickets yet, um, then you need to go and buy your tickets, inshallah. You can go to Brother Hassan and Nayila's uh, Facebook page. You can go to their um, Instagram page, you know, for more information about Manage My Flow one day uh, marriage retreat that will be happening August 4th and 5th, inshallah. The fourth Saturday uh, will be for the married couples and uh, Sunday will be for the singles. Um, But um, this weekend, um, actually, I leave tomorrow. I'll be in Cincinnati, Ohio for this weekend for the Hula um, uh, Conscious Coupling um, uh, event. So if you're in the Cincinnati, Ohio um, area, you know, come out to this event and benefit. Purchase your tickets. Go to www.hula.com uh, and check them out and buy your tickets, inshallah, and come out and benefit This type of information is not being, you know, offered nowhere else, man. I, I can say that hands down. When it comes to marriage and divorce, it comes to, you know, marital issues. If you're looking for some tips, if you're looking for some information to help you and your spouse better enhance the quality of your marriage. You need to be at these events. You need to be at these events, man. Picking up as much information as you possibly can about marriage. Cincinnati, Ohio, that will be, um, I will be there tomorrow. The event will be Saturday. The event is on Saturday, inshallah. You can go to www.khula.com uh, for more information. You can go to their Facebook page or you can go to their website for more information. Khula, that's K-H-O-O-L-A-H, Khula. All right. Um, so, uh, that's, that's, you know, this weekend. And then of course, two weeks from now, we have our manage my flow one day marriage retreat myself, uh, in that clay couple and Hassan and Nayela will also be in Cincinnati as well. All right. They will also be flying in from Atlanta, uh, down to, or up to Cincinnati inshallah. So, uh, they will be there as well. Um, So come out and get this information, man. You're not going to get this information anywhere else. So let me start with um, what I initially uh, opened up the Periscope this morning to talk about. Um, one of the things that I'm talking about this weekend uh, in my PowerPoint presentation is baggage. All right. We hear this term used all the time. We hear this, you know, these phrases, unpack your bags. Let me unpack this bag for you. Um, baggage. Let's talk about baggage in relationships. And we all have it. We all have baggage. We all bring baggage with us to the relationship. Uh, but a baggage is unprocessed, unprocessed negative emotions. That's what baggage is. Unprocessed. Pay attention to the wording. Unprocessed negative emotions that we've acquired through past negative experiences, whether sexually or otherwise, from people, places, and behaviors that have a negative impact on where we are right now, currently, presently in our lives. Okay? That's the definition of baggage. Emotional baggage. We have, emo many of us, we have emotional baggage. What is emotional baggage? It is unprocessed. Pay attention to the words. Unprocessed, meaning we have not, we have yet to unpack those emotions, look at them one by one, and begin to deal with them. All right? The human body, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how God has structured our bodies, our brains, 
is that when we have traumatic experiences in our lives, what we do is we compartmentalize them, we store them. Our brain functions like a computer. It, fi it creates files. That's what our brain does. It creates files and it stores the information in those folders, in those files to allow us to continue living our lives. If not, had it not been for our brain's uh, ability to compartmentalize our experiences, we would be far more damaged than what we are. If we've learned how to pro if we've learned how to compartmentalize negative experiences in our lives and we're still traumatized by that. Could you imagine if they were staring us right in our faces 24/7? Could you imagine if these negative experiences were staring us in our faces 24/7? Absolutely. So what the brain does is that when we have a negative experience, whether in childhood, in adulthood, whatever, we have a negative experience, a traumatic experience, our brain, you know, we go through the seven stages of grief and all of that. We grieve, we, you know, we, pro, you know, process it enough to realize that it's painful, it's traumatic. And then sometimes we don't want to deal with it. So we compartmentalize it. We store it. We store it in the back of our minds. However, when we store that, that negative experience, when we, when we store those negative unprocessed uh, emotions, they begin to manifest. And that's what I'm talking about today. How emotional baggage affects us. It doesn't go away because you forgot about it. It doesn't go away because you chose not to deal with it. It doesn't go away. It doesn't just disappear. All you did was store it. All you did was store that experience in a folder in the back of your mind. However, that information slowly but surely begins to trickle. It's just like a computer. When you store too many files in a computer, your comp it starts to, you know, when you open up a file in that particular folder, you know, maybe um, if it's Word, the Word is not processing you know what I mean? Like it's it's it come it becomes difficult for the computer to process because there's so much stored in that folder. So much stored in that folder. All right. And our brains, yes, it starts to glitch. And this is what happens to the human being. We start to glitch. We wonder why we're in a current relationship. It seems like everything is good in this situation, but I keep having these negative outbursts, these negative experiences. Where in the hell are they coming from? They're coming from all of the unprocessed negative emotions that you have acquired over the years from traumatic experiences, from people, places, behaviors that are affecting your current relationship now. Let's, we, we unpacking this right now, man. That's right. That's right, Sister Jessica. It doesn't go away. So let's talk about how these um, this negative emotional baggage, how it affects you. And I want you guys to do some you know, introspection now. I want you to begin to look at yourself. This, these conversations that we're having, it's not for, for us to say, oh, I know somebody who's going through that right now. No, it's for you to look at yourself and say, this is why I'm going through this right now. This is why I'm having these experiences right now. We're unpacking our bags, man. Just years and years and years of baggage that we have stored in our subconscious, that we have stored in the back of our minds, that we have compartmentalized, that we thought that because we don't want to deal with it, that it's gone, it's away, I don't have to deal with it. No, it's right there staring you in your face, man. And meanwhile, you're in a relationship with somebody. Meanwhile, you're in a marriage with somebody trying to figure out why is this guy a good guy, but we still having all these problems. Why is this sister a good sister, but we still seem to be having all these problems? The problem is not your marriage, man. The problem is you. The problem is not your marriage. You have unpacked baggage that you have not begun to reach in and sort out all of that crap. And what we end up doing, which is another thing I'm going to talk about this weekend, is exploitation, toxic love, toxic love. We want somebody else to come in and repair us. 
or we go into a relationship with somebody draining them for what we believe we need and leaving that person as an empty shell. And then what that person does, this is how this stuff transfers from one person to the next. You drain your spouse. Eventually, they can't take it anymore. They want a divorce. They want out. They want a hula. They leave your relationship, and then they go to another relationship and take back what you took from them from somebody else. And it's just an ongoing, it's a cycle. It's a cycle, and it never stops. It's a cycle of negative, toxic behavior Absolutely. Hurt people, hurt people. You in a relationship with somebody that's toxic, they're draining you, draining you, draining you. Emotionally, they're draining you. And then when you, when they decide to move on because they're done with you, they got everything they needed from you, right? They leave you as an empty shell. And then now you're empty and now you looking for somebody to fill your cup. So you go into a relationship with somebody else and you drain them. And then they go into a relationship with somebody else. They drain them. They go into it. Like, and it's an ongoing cycle of pain. It's a vicious cycle. Yes. Of pain. Of pain. And meanwhile, we're sitting back talking about ain't no good brothers or sisters around. Well, you know why, genius? Because we're constantly taken from one another. That's why there's no good brothers or good sisters around. You want to know why? <laughs> Because we're constantly draining one another. So yeah, there is no good brothers or sisters around. We all walking around empty. Thanks to this ongoing trend that we started way before many of us even became Muslim. We brought this stuff with us into Islam. Islam is not the problem. Muslim leaders are part of the problem because we don't address it. But Islam is not the problem. It's not, oh, I'm not looking for no more Muslim brothers. I'm tired of Muslim brothers. Muslim brothers are not the problem. We all sick, man. We all have, you know, this baggage that we're bringing from one relationship to the next. Oh, Allah Musta'an. So unprocessed negative emotions. Some of us are broken from childhood issues. Yes, unresolved unprocessed emotions from past negative experiences either due to people places or behaviors all right that have a negative impact on us now so let's talk about the negative impact of baggage negative emotional baggage number one one of the biggest effects of emotional baggage is what's called projection projection we tend to project our pain on others who remind us of our pain. When you're in a relationship with somebody and they remind you of something negative that somebody else did to you, your reaction to them, your response to that trigger is now taken out on that person. You understand? Now you're taking it out on that person. Meanwhile, the spouse is like, well, damn, what did I do to you? Or you were joking with the person in the car, right? You were, jerk, you were joking with your spouse in the car and they took the joke out of context and now it turns into a whole big argument and you're like, I was just joking with you. No, what you did was you triggered them. You triggered them. You understand? And their response to your joke, right, was the same response that they gave to the person that hurt them the first time or the response they wanted to give to the person that hurt them the first time. Facts. Facts. Sometimes you don't even know that you're triggering your spouse. You don't even know that you said something and it was just in jest. It was in joke. You were just joking, but you don't realize that that joke was a trigger. The other person doesn't even realize that they were triggered. The other person doesn't even realize that they were triggered. And where that where that seriousness, where that sensitivity, where that came from. You're, 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 as a spouse, you're like, well, why are you getting so sensitive and bent out of shape? It was a joke. Nah, I wasn't. Don't joke with me like that. I don't play like that. Right. You know why they don't joke like that? You know why they don't play like that? Because that joke had a seriousness behind it from a previous experience, a previous negative experience that they had. And we don't even know that we've been, we're, we're triggered. 
We don't even know that our spouse is triggering us because we are not aware of our triggers. It's not the spouse's fault who joked. They don't know you. They don't know what, you know, what damage has been done to you in your previous. They don't know. And that's part of the problem is because we haven't really acknowledged. And I'll, I'll get to the solutions to this this weekend. I'm not sharing that with you guys. I'm sorry. You know, you got to you got to attend the event. If you don't attend the event, then you have to wait until another event comes up. But the solutions to unpacking your bags, part of the workshop that I'm doing this weekend in Cincinnati is unpacking your bag. Let me tell you, let me show you how to unpack your bag, go to baggage claim, claim your bag, and then go to your hotel room and unpack. I'm going to show you how to do that. But I, I can't get that away for free. I'm sorry. This I'm giving you for free. You ain't have to pay for this. I'm giving you this for free. But I can't give you everything. I can't give you, you know, the game is to be sold, not told. I, I can't give you everything, man. Go to baggage claim, collect your bag, and then go home and unpack. Absolutely. Part of my workshop will be teaching people how to unpack their bags. All right. Uh, you can reach out to them. That might be an option. That might be an option. You can reach out to go to Kula.com and you can reach out to the administrators and ask if, in fact, they have an online option where people can pay to attend online. That would actually be awesome. Why not use the technology? We have it. Why not use it? All right. So so the first thing is projection. You begin to project your pain on to your spouse, on to the person that you are in a relationship currently because that person did something, said something, right, that triggered that negative, unprocessed emotion. Part of the reason that you have baggage is because it's unprocessed. You haven't processed that. You haven't sat down. And this is for brothers and sisters who jump from one relationship to the next and you never give yourself enough time to process everything that just happened. You just got out of a relationship. You were just in a relationship with somebody for a year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years. You got to process all of that, man. You can't bury that and move on to another relationship just hoping that you numb yourself, which is another problem. You, you understand? Numbing yourself, emotional numbing. That's what we do. It's like taking a drink of alcohol once you're going through something bad. And instead of us drinking, we jump from relationship to relationship, which is just as, just as dangerous because we're numbing ourselves. So let's go back to the projection. You projecting your pain on other person and the person don't even know why. What did I do to you? I'm just joking with you. I'm just joking with you. Why are you so serious? Why are you so sensitive? Because you triggered something in that person and they don't even know that that comment or that joke or that statement was a trigger. They didn't even know it was a trigger. So we're constantly, your spouse is constantly triggering you and you are projecting on your spouse. You're projecting on your spouse all of your pain and it's not fair. It's not fair to project on your spouse all of the pain that you have experienced from your past relationship. That person didn't do anything to you. That person does not deserve that. So that's number one, projection. So if you find yourself in a relationship with your spouse, you being art, you being argumentative with them, you being defensive with them, you're you're constantly lashing out at them. You have to step back and ask yourself. Step back and ask yourself, why in the hell am I so angry with my spouse? What did they do to deserve that? What did they do to, des to deserve that? They did nothing. All they did was say something, do something that triggered something that you are already going through. An unprocessed emotion that you failed to take the time out to address. Number two. From the negative impacts, you guys got that. I'm hoping you guys are following and you're paying attention to this. You're doing some introspection. You're doing some self-evaluation. We need it in the worst way, man. I don't get on here to entertain, man. I'm getting on here to educate and empower. Number two, what we end up doing because of the negative, because of the um, 
negative emotional baggage that we have in, that we have is uh, we become protective, overprotective of our feelings. We don't want to share what we're going through with anybody. Nobody understands me or I don't want anybody to see me as broken as I am. And we good for that in the Islamic community because all we do is throw an overgarment over top of it. We broken from top, from head to toe. We cracked, shattered from head to toe. We throw an overgarment over top of it and we're perfectly fine. Right? We throw a thobe on and we're fine. You understand? This is how we layer, we layer, right? When you were younger, it was cold outside, your mother layered you, right? She put on, you know, socks, you put on your thermals, you put on a pair, of, you know, sweatpants, you put on a pair of jeans on top, and then you go outside and deal with the cold because you layer. We do the same thing emotionally. We layer. We put on an overgarment, right? We get hurt. We put on an overgarment, we go outside, and we nobody can see us. We put on niqab, right? Cover our faces, because nobody can see our pain. Nobody can see our pain. Nobody can see how broken we are, how shattered we are. We want everybody to continue to believe that we're perfectly fine. We put on a thobe, white thobe, we come to the masjid, the white thobe radiates. So all you see is the white thobe, but you don't see underneath that white thobe is a broken boy. A broken boy. Who's now a man, and it becomes very difficult to repair him. Frederick Douglass said it best, that it's easier to repair you know, a, um, you know, a scarred child than to fix a broken man can't fix a broken man you broken that's just what it is man you got to unpack all of that stuff from years of childhood you know injury and and you know hurt and pain and trauma you got to unpack all of that stuff before you can begin being whole you understand so we throw an overgarment on you know we learn a few islamic phrases you know, just to keep everybody back off of us. Yeah, Ibn Taymiyyah said, and the scholars of the Salaf said, and all of this stuff, man. And it sounds real good, man. It sounds real good. But beneath all of that, beneath all of that, is a broken individual. Scarred and shattered from past traumatic experiences that you have yet to unpack. You can parade around with your niqab on, with your all black on, with your selfie this and stuff. You can parade around, man. I see straight through all of that. Straight through all of it. Same thing with the brothers. You can parade around with your thobe on. You can take pictures of yourself and post it on Instagram. Like everything is fine. You know and I know that your life is in shambles. Right. So what we do is we become guarded, overprotective of our experiences, overprotective of our emotions. We don't want to share it with nobody. We don't want to let anybody in. And what we end up doing is emotionally numbing ourselves to our experience, hoping that we just forget about it altogether. Forget that it ever happened. You were married to a sister. You were broke. You didn't have any money. She was paying for everything. She said something to you that shattered your whole manhood. Shattered your entire manhood. You need to get yourself together. I'm tired of taking care of you. You're a grown man. Why I got to keep taking care of you as a grown man? Shattered your whole existence as a man. And then what you do, you divorce her, leave out of the marriage, scarred, broken, shattered. And then you go jump right into another relationship. You tell everybody, ah, oh, the sister wasn't for me. Nah, it wasn't that she wasn't for you, brother. <laughs> it wasn't that she wasn't for you. You weren't for her. <laughs> Truth be told. You understand? Like, alhamdulillah, one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with, alhamdulillah, is I'm very perceptive. I may not catch on right then and there. I'm a little slow on, on the draw. I'm a little slow, but when I get it, I got it. When I get it, I got it. 
brothers and sisters have to realize, man, that you cannot numb yourself to the pain that you are experiencing by going into a relationship with somebody else, just hoping that it just disappears. It doesn't disappear. You are scarred. A woman cheated on you in high school, right? You were a dude, you were a guy in high school. You poured all your love out into the first woman who showed you some attention. She scarred you. She hurt you. She cheated on you. And now you make it your life's journey, you know, to, you know, to mess over every woman you come in contact with simply because you did not, you did not process the pain that this first woman caused you in your life. Right. And that's another thing. Thank you, Jessica. Very good. For all of you second, third generation Muslims, you tend to think that you're perfect because you've been Muslim all your life. Well, guess what? If we're just now recently, you know, exposing a lot of this stuff that we have been going through, you being Muslim all your life means absolutely nothing. You've been coddled by Islam your entire life, hiding behind ayats from the Quran, hiding behind hadith from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu your entire life. You have been hiding behind Islam. Islam has been a covering for a lot of you second, third generation Muslims. I've been Muslim all my life. I've been born and raised on Islam. Yeah, well, that means absolutely nothing. That means absolutely nothing. Because the fact of the matter is that you've been coddled by Islam your entire life. Every time you get scared and afraid, you run behind an ayat, you run behind a hadith, you hide behind textual evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah, Stare, scared to stand in your discomfort and deal with your own issues. So this whole idea that, you know, I was born and raised Muslim, you know, I've been Muslim all of my life as if, as if that somehow exempts you from the, the trauma and the pain that normal human beings experience. You're self-deluded. Many of you who are born and raised Muslim, right? Second, third generation Muslim. Islam has been in your family for generations, blah, blah, blah. To the end of that, many of you are self-deluded. You will never take the opportunity to focus on you and your issues because you're constantly using the fact. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Men abta'ahu amaluhu lam yusri'uhu nasabuhu. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever is held back by his deeds will not be propelled forward because of his lineage. So what? You were born and raised Muslim. So what? Your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents are Muslim. So what? If you have not put in the necessary work for yourself, as Allah says in the Quran, um, that everyone will have what they strive for. And the human being can have nothing except what he or she strives for. The Prophet said, whoever is held back by his actions will not be propelled forward by his lineage. So what Islam has been in your family? That does not protect you or guard you or somehow preserve you in a way where you are unaffected by the normal traumas and, you know, experiences that affect normal human beings. You are just as in, just as affected as everybody else. It's just that other people choose to recognize, you know, their brokenness. Meanwhile, you sit back from a place of privilege talking about how Islam has been in your family all these years and, you know, these are new convert problems, right? No, these ain't new convert problems, man. Sorry. So you become overprotective about your feelings. You don't want to share it with anybody. You want everybody to continue thinking that you're perfect, right? You want everybody to continue thinking that you're perfect. So you emotionally numb yourself. You don't even feel anymore. It's a mercy to feel anything. No, I, I, no, nah, I'm good. Nah, I'm not good. <laughs> Bil ax, <laughs> the total opposite. I'm not good. We like to get out of relationships, and you know, somebody, you know, yo, you all right? You good? Yeah, I'm good, man. Nah, that's her fault. You know what I mean? Like she's that's her loss. Mashallah. No, it's both of your loss. When people separate, it ain't a loss for one person, man. How are you so self deluded into thinking, oh, that's her loss? Cause I know my worth, right? Everybody has worth. Everybody has worth. Hello. <laughs> Let me wake you up to that reality. Everybody has worth. 
That's that person's loss. I know my worth. And then there you go right into another relationship with this whole, I know my worth. I know, you know, you understand what I'm saying? You go right into another relationship with that same mentality that it's their loss. I know my worth. And I'm sorry if I can't be in the life of somebody who doesn't recognize my worth. It's not that the person didn't recognize your worth. Sometimes the problem is you recognize your worth sometimes a little too much. <laughs> sometimes a little bit too much. Number three is we become indecisive. We start to think that, dang, I made this mistake before, I made that mistake before, and I don't want to make these mistakes again. So you become indecisive about yourself, indecisive about your decisions. You take too much, you put too much energy into making decisions now because you are basing your current decision off of your last decision. If somebody took advantage of you, as I said before, that's not your fault, that's their fault. Which leads me to my next point, which is you become untrusting of yourself. You become indecisive and then you end up not having any trust in yourself. That's what negative emotional baggage does. And a lot of sisters, what you do sometimes is you get out of a relationship with a man, right? He was religious, you know, the religious guy, you know, because you, you have that luxury to say, you know, I don't want a brother who's too religious or I don't want a sister who's too this and too that. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Like you have that luxury. So I was in a relationship with this religious brother who prayed five times a day, mashallah. And then, you know, that didn't work. So I'm, I'm done with the religious brothers. So I'm going to go after brothers who are not so religious. Perhaps my marriage will last longer. This is the sick mentality that we have. This is the sick mentality that we have, man. Like, literally, man. SubhanAllah. I just wish I had more time to unpack some of this stuff, man. Why you sit back and say, you know, I was married to a brother who used to pray five times a day and wear thobes and all of that other stuff. So you're going to base, this is what I was talking about, about the stereotypes. And that's another thing that I get into. A lot of people, when I put the post up last night, they didn't understand where I was going with that. A lot of the preferences that we have about who we're going to marry, who we not going to marry, a lot of those preferences are rooted in stereotypes. One sister posted on, you know, uh, Twitter. She thought that that was dismissive. Like, why don't we ever read to understand instead of reading to just comment? We live in a generation where we just love to talk, love to speak. We just love to hear ourselves talk. Why don't you sometimes just listen to the person to understand their perspective? Let me just see where they're going with this. Because I, if I put out a post and you don't fully understand it, how in the hell can you comment on something that you don't understand? I would never put my, I would just ask for deeper clarification. I would just say, you know, could you elaborate a little bit more? Elaborate a little bit more because I don't fully understand where you're going with this. Always, always make the person fully explain themselves before you decide to comment. Reserve your, your comments. That's smart because you don't have to comment to begin with. I don't have to comment. I can keep my opinions to myself. <laughs> I can keep my comments to myself. I actually don't have to comment. <laughs> you understand? I can look at a person's post and just say, hmm, you know, and keep it moving. I don't have to comment. <laughs> but if I do comment, then I want to engage the person I want to engage you. So I'm going to ask you for further clarification first before I comment. Because I want to make sure I understand you clearly before I comment. You understand? Let me get this straight. Tell me if I'm understanding you correctly. Blah, 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 blah. And then when the person says, yes, that's exactly what I mean. Okay, now I can comment because I fully grasp what you understand, what you said. You understand? But I'm amazed at people who just comment on stuff and they have absolutely no understanding what the person is trying to say. Provided, sometimes I say things and I live in my own head. So sometimes I say things and they don't actually come out, you know, clear, you know, as, as people would like them to be, you know, because it's from my mouth, from my head. 
trying to pass that on to thousands of people who are following me. You understand? So sometimes pe some people don't get it. All you have to do is ask for further clarification. Don't assume you understand what I'm saying. Just say, hey, listen, not totally clear. Could you elaborate a little bit more for me? But a lot of our preferences that we have as Muslims are rooted in stereotypes. And I said that that's part of the reason why people are still single. We got all these preferences. I don't want to marry a sister like this. Or I don't want to marry a brother like that. Or whatever. The and a lot of those preferences are rooted in stereotypes. I don't want to marry a sister who don't cover or who don't wear hijab. Not because your preference is you don't want to marry a sister who don't wear hijab because it doesn't necessarily work for you. You don't want to marry a sister who doesn't wear hijab because you believe that a sister who doesn't wear hijab is not Muslim or is not a good Muslim. And in fact, there may be sisters who don't wear hijab that are actually better practicing Muslims than the sisters that do wear hijab. Facts all day. Don't ever use the hijab as a standard of whether or not the person is religious or not. Ever. We've seen too much in this Islamic community to, uh, you, know, you know, to continue using this as a standard. The hijab is not a standard. Trust me. Taqwa, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a standard. And taqwa, the place of taqwa is in the heart of the Prophet said, "Taqwa ha huna wa ashara ila sadrihi thalatha marat." The Prophet said, "Taqwa is here," and he pointed to his chest three times. You don't know who fears Allah. You don't know who fears Allah. And then someone, some genius, could say, "Well, if the sister really feared Allah, wouldn't she wear hijab?" Didn't the Prophet Sallallahu say that a man may do the deeds? Pay attention to this. The man, they, a man may do a deed from the deeds of the people of paradise. Outwardly, what appears to be the deeds of the people of paradise. Until there's a short span of time left between him and death. And then death overtakes him. And he begins to do the deeds of the people of the hellfire. And that's what he dies on. The ibrah from our lives, the lesson from our lives is not what we live on, what we die on. What you die on took me a whole journey in Islam to arrive at that understanding. See, when you're young, you're immature, you see in the entire world in front of you as black and white, halal, haram. That's how you see life, right? And that is usually based upon a, a very narrow, very shallow worldview. When you travel the world and you meet people and you see people's conditions and you see people's lives, you start to realize that it's not as black and white and halal and haram as you think it is. It's not. It's not. Some people, some people, some Muslims may take fear on King Fahad. Rahmatullahi alayhi. May Allah have mercy upon him. Some people, I remember when I was in the Islamic University, you have Muslims, Saudis, who deemed King Fahad to be a kafir. He used to come to America, used to drink, gamble, and this, that's a well-known fact, Saudis, they, that's what they do. All right. Nonetheless, um, they had a picture of him wearing a cross, trying to honor, you know, whatever was going on in America at that time or whatever. You know, he had some actions about him that outwardly appear that, you know, this guy is not even Muslim. But when you think about some of the stuff that he did that still exists, that Muslims still benefit from today, <laughs> it's enough to make you just keep your mouth shut. It's enough to make you literally keep your mouth shut and say, you know, his relationship is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You understand? So that, that was that. Um, give me one second. All right, I got time for one more, one more. Actually, it's the last one, and that is uh, comparisons. That because of negative, uh, negative baggage, uh, sometimes what we do is we begin to compare ourselves to what our lives would be like if we didn't have this experience. We start to say, well, what if this person never did this to me? What my life would have been like if this would have never happened, if that would have never happened, right? And we begin to compare ourselves and in comparing ourselves, we continue to feel inferior 
believing that our lives would have been better if in fact you know we didn't go through this situation or that situation nonetheless this is what i wanted to share with you guys this morning stay tuned for more if you're going to be in cincinnati ohio and shallow Ta'ala this weekend uh, for the Hula Conference, the Conscious Coupling Conference, inshallah, will be in Cincinnati uh, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, inshallah, ta'ala. And then in two weeks, August 4th, August 5th, uh, inshallah, ta'ala, we'll be in Maryland. Uh, myself, that clay couple, inshallah, and we'll be doing Manage My Flow, the one day marriage retreat. If you have not bought your tickets yet, go and buy your tickets. Jazakumullah khairan for giving me your time. Um, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah bless us to begin to unpack, you know, our baggage and begin to deal with our issues uh, realistically. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam al-tasleem al-kathira wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.